Ready? Mm -hmm. Of course. This is this. Good energy. <laughs> All right. Welcome to this talk. Uh, we are going to talk about focus on your code, not infrastructure. I don't know how to fix the slide alignment issue here. We'll have to, uh, you'll have to imagine what the rest of the slide says. Uh, so my name is Martin Omander, and this is what I look like when I wear a denim jacket. <laughs> um, and uh, I was born and raised in Sweden. I lived uh, these last 19 years in Silicon Valley. And I worked, before Google, I worked at uh, three startups as a software engineer. And now I work at Google. I've been there for 12, almost 13 years. And my job is developer advocate. And what that means is I tell awesome developers like you about Google Cloud products that you can use to build better apps yourselves. And I listen to you about how you're using the Google Cloud and what is working well for you and what isn't. So I can bring that back to the product managers and so that they build better products. And I'm in meetings with them weekly and they always ask me, Martin, Martin, what are those developers, real people out there? How are they using your stuff? Is it working for them, isn't it? So there will, uh, if you, after this, if you have feedback on any of the products we talked about here, please let me know. There will also be a survey where you can fill it out in text form, if you like. Hi, I am Zoe Omander. I have lived in Silicon Valley my whole life, meaning I was born and raised in California, so I've never experienced this cult, but we'll see how that goes. <laughs> How many degrees difference was it getting there was, on and off uh, the plane? There was 86 degrees difference from getting on the plane in California versus getting off the plane here in Chicago. <laughs> so Welcome. you might imagine that was a little bit weird for me. I play the guitar and ukulele in my free time, also not in my free time. I'm not very good at attending my classes. Uh, I'm Martin's daughter, and I'm also an online student. Excellent, great. And before we dig into this and the ingest startup that has also been cut off, you are going to help me uh, because my manager, when he heard that I'm going to Chicago, he's like, oh yeah, you'll just go there and party and hang out and have some deep dish pizza and so on. So, uh, and freeze your ass off. So, uh, <laughs> so I, we are going to show him that I'm actually here giving a talk, and they're actually real people, flesh and blood, that I'm talking to. So I'm going to be over here, and you're going to wave to my manager and smile, and it is both hands, please. Yeah. And for extra points, you know, this is purely optional. So both hands is mandatory. Purely optional. You can mouth out, sort of mime out. Please approve Martin's expense report. <laughs> <laughs> so please big wave here. Yes, very good, very good. We'll take, let's see there. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much. If that doesn't get my expense report approved, I don't know what will. So yeah, we're going to talk about the ingest startup. And this is a fictional startup. They, uh, is Beth is running this startup, and her mission is to spread joy to the world, and she's good at programming. She has a use case in mind, and as you know, whenever you build something, new app, whatever you write software for, it's good to have um, a user persona in, in mind. So Beth's user persona here is Alice, who is uh, on her phone a lot, like someone's daughter. And, uh, Excuse me. <laughs> and Alice is on the phone a lot. Uh, the service, the use case for Beth's service here is really simple. Alice would send a text message to Beth's service to a phone number, and then Alice would get a joke back. And we will have spread joy to the world and made the world a, a little better place. Well, how would you code that system then? Yeah, so first off, uh, how would you build this? Well, if you go online and search for a highly available, highly performant web-based system, you will find lots of great resources, like this uh, diagram here that shows in a very simple way how you can set up with 27 servers, how you can set up a highly performant system. And this is the Wikipedia um, architecture. 
well that seems extremely complicated is there an easier way to do something like this yeah uh, 27 boxes Beth is thinking might be a little bit too much let's not build this highly available highly uh, performance system with 27 boxes let's build it with two instead so over here we have Alice who sends the SMS message it goes into Twilio which is a, a different company it's not part of Google not affiliated with Google but they are an SMS gateway so they basically translate SMS text messages into HTTP calls and then the uh, that the, there would be an HTTP call going into a microservice that Beth would build on cloud, uh, on Google Cloud Platform, on Cloud Functions specifically. Has anyone here used Twilio, the gateway? Yep. Oh, wow, oh, many. Wow. How did you like it? Did it work well for you? Yes? Okay, cool, good. I've used it to build this demo, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it worked pretty well for me. I'm pretty happy with it. Then how would you code this system? Oh. Nope, that doesn't matter. Anyways. Yeah, let's not answer that call right now. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, the question then is what goes in this box? This is the box that Beth needs to write code for. Uh, she would write it in Cloud Functions because then this box becomes very simple. Uh, it so happens that Beth likes JavaScript. So she writes this in Cloud Functions in Node, the Node flavor of JavaScript. Has anyone here used Node flavor JavaScript? Oh yeah, okay, wow, lots of you. So it's server-side JavaScript. Um, Cloud Functions also supports Go and Python, if you prefer those languages. So uh, you would import, uh, Beth would import a few libraries here from Twilio. She would declare the function. This is a node JavaScript kind of way of, of declaring a, a function, a pub, public function. It's supposed to say exports over there to the left. Um, this is a function that, we, that uh, should configure Twilio to call whenever a text message comes in. And in this, she would just uh, create an SMS response, put the joke in the SMS response, and then send back the SMS response as in XML format, because that is the format that Twilio likes. And then it's done. So here is a highly available service. It runs on Google infrastructure, so uh, it doesn't really go down much. And it, is, it runs all the time. No, uh, she doesn't need to be on and, and configure the server. She just needs to deploy this one file, call this index.js, and deploy it. Except there's one thing missing. This code run, will not run as written here. Can anyone spot what I left out? The second to last line of code. Yes. Get joke. Yes, very good. Here is a call made to get joke and get joke. The function get joke has not been defined anywhere, of course. Very well done. Sorry, what's your name? Ina. Ina? Yeah. Well done, Ina. Uh, yeah, we need to define get joke as well. So index.js will be a little longer than just this. Uh, and the reason originally I would show get joke when I made this presentation, people would wonder, would wonder about the get joke function. I'm not real proud of this code I'm going to show you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so please don't judge me. This is an MVP for startup. It's meant to be very simple, get going very quickly. It's not meant to be elegant. OK, here's how the code starts. Can you see where this is going? <laughs> yes, that's right. We have a hard-coded array of jokes. I invented a new word, plagiarism. Excellent dad joke, right? So. <laughs> oh, this is the one I had to explain to you the other night. Yeah. <laughs> I can explain this to anybody else. <laughs> if a joke needs explaining, it is not a good joke. Oh. <laughs> that's true. Well, then it's a dad joke, so I guess that's what you're trying to get. <laughs> and here we have three jokes, and then we have the actual function, get a joke. And uh, here we just pick a random number of the array, get the length of the array, pick a random number, and then we just return the joke at that index. And now the service actually works. All this goes into index.js, the previous slide, and this. And the service is running, highly available, highly performant. 
Well, there are very few jokes on here. I don't think three would be enough for a system. <laughs> so wouldn't you need more? Yes. Uh, absolutely. So the, this is the first feedback that the investors have for Beth with her, her uh, new startup. They say, you need more jokes. Don't worry, we're going to fund you, but you need to hire a content editor. So she does. She hires Charles. He is great at jokes. Uh, he sits there and comes up with new jokes, and he uh, comes up with one, and he says, like, oh, 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 Beth, 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 I came up, up with this great joke about, about Belgians. Can you put that in? And, okay, she dutifully opens up index.js, uh, uh, makes the array one element longer, enters it, deploys it. Five minutes later, Charles is like, oh, Beth, 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 we're getting terrible user feedback. The people in Belgium don't like that joke we just put in. Can you take it out? Okay, she dutifully opens up index.js, deletes that line, deploys it again. And again, five minutes later, he has a new joke, et cetera, et cetera. Wouldn't that get very boring? And also, isn't that tedious for Beth to do? Indeed, very tedious. If you, as a developer, have, been, um, have, have ever been caught in the content, been part of the content deployment loop, you know that that's not a good place to be in. The business people in your organization should be able to deploy new content without us developers being involved. Here, Beth is part of the deployment loop. So Beth considers, what should I do here? Well, I guess I could build, instead of having a person here, this here could be an admin, admin interface. So she considers, I could build something in Angular or React, like a simple web app where Charles can go in and, and add and remove and, and edit joke entries and store them somehow. And, and it'll take me a couple of weeks to build that. But I, she doesn't want to spend a couple of weeks on that. This, this is a startup. There's so many things to do in the startup. Also, why spend weeks and weeks on building something that's going to be used by one person, Charles? It's better to build something that's going to be used by the teeming millions out there that are clamoring for excellent daddy jokes. So, and then she realizes there is an admin interface. Somebody already wrote one. And it has all kinds of JavaScript thing in it. It supports multiple users at the same time. It, uh, you can add, add it, delete. It is very advanced. Somebody else is maintaining the code, so if there are bugs in it, Beth won't be on the hook for fixing them. What is that interface? I'm going to show you what it looks like. It looks like this. It's a Google spreadsheet. <laughs> Somebody already wrote this code. Beth doesn't have to write it. This is a, a great way of, well, writing. It's not writing in use the uh, admin interface. It's actually just providing one for your users. <coughs> Zoe, do you know which one my favorite joke is here? Uh, yes, let me find it one second. Ah, your favorite one is number 10. Yes. Uh, let's see. What's good about Switzerland? I don't know, but the flag is a big plus. <laughs> see, they do like that. <laughs> and you will just hear a continuous groan from this side of the room. <laughs> so here, uh, Charles can, um, can enter his jokes. And uh, add, it, add, it, uh, add, edit, remove uh, all day long. And they could even be multiple Charles. If he hires a whole team of people, they can still work effortlessly in the same spreadsheet because that's what Google Spreadsheets can do, can support multiple users. How would you code this then into the system? Ah, right. So now the microservice doesn't have the jokes inside it like before, but it needs to make an HTTP call over to the Google Sheets here. We're using, we would use the, Beth would use the uh, Sheets API. Has anyone here used the Google Sheets API? Oh, one, two, three, four. Oh, cool. Oh, five. The Googler as well. <laughs> Very good. Uh, those of you who have used it, uh, how, how did you find it? Was it hard? Easy? How did you like it? Felt like the API kept changing. Like the API kept changing. Yeah. Oh, no. It was. It was like whoops, and then they the made an API change, but not a docs change, and uh, it didn't work. And that's generally my experience with Google Sheets. 
Oh dear. Oh dear. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I like you're being honest. <laughs> and what else do you choose? Yeah. It worked like 90% of the time, and then 10% of the time that happened to me too, so it changed mid production. So I oh. was left in the dust, but it was fine. Oh my gosh. Oh dear. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to show you the very latest. <laughs> <laughs> so the code. Um, would uh, look like this. We need to import the Google APIs, and then uh, this would be an async function, is what it says up there. Um, it it uh, makes it very easy to um, to do authentication, because you just say, in your Google Cloud account, in your console, there is all of your code on, in the Google Cloud runs as a specific user. It's called a service account. It looks That service account looks kind of like an email, if you copy paste that email address, you can go to your spreadsheet and say share the spreadsheet and paste in that email address, just like you would paste in like if you would share it with a coworker or somebody else. And then this code that runs in the Google Cloud can read your spreadsheet without having to deal with passwords or token or OAuth, any of any of that stuff. All you need to say here, you just say it's the spreadsheet's API and isn't it? Um, then we need to say what version we're using. Yes, always use the latest one. For example. <laughs> this is the latest one for now. <laughs> um, uh, get the response. So uh, when we send to, when we ask spreadsheets for data, what what do we, what parameters do we need to send to the spreadsheets API? Any guesses? The user. So. Uh, we don't actually because uh, we already shared the spreadsheet with that user. Yeah. Spreadsheet. Yeah. Uh, ID because you could have you could potentially have several spreadsheets with the same name. Yep. Yeah. So here is spreadsheet ID. This is when you you do Google spreadsheets. At the top in the address bar, you have this long ID looking thing. You just paste that in there. What what else do we need? Yeah. The column and row. Column and row and the worksheet. Yeah. Exactly. So you can give that in, in a few different uh, formats. Here we're using this, uh, uh, um, it's a sheet, name a sheet, exclamation mark, and then we read this A column, A means the whole A column. So we read that, we get this back as a two-dimensional array. The spreadsheet always re returns two-dimensional array because you can ask for multiple columns. So there'll be a little, oh, here we go. Here, there'll be a little JavaScript trickery to with an arrow function to transform it to one-dimensional um, array. You could also, uh, I mean, have a for loop if you if you don't like arrow functions. And then this code is an old friend. We recognize this. Get a random index in this array and return the joke. Uh, so it's a little less code. Everything's working well. Everything's good here. Now there's an admin interface. Now uh, Charles, he's really good at his job. So he produces tens of jokes, hundreds <laughs> of jokes, thousands of jokes, even tens of thousands of jokes. Loud that sound effect. <laughs> 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 even tens of thousands of jokes he comes up with, or maybe steals from the internet, we don't quite know. <laughs> now we're starting to hear this service that ran so well is now starting to run into some problems. What kind of problems might we run into here? Any guesses? Slow up. Because you're loading all the jokes? Yes, excellent. Exactly. Well done. Yeah, sometimes this becomes slow. I've done a lot of tests with 10,000 jokes in the database. Most of the time it's fine. But every now and then it becomes a little slower than you would like. Because, just like you were saying, the code reads all 10,000 jokes, picks one, throws away 9,999 jokes and returns that one to the user. And does that every time there is a request. So inefficient way of doing it. At this point, it's, it's spreadsheets is great for smaller data, uh, data volumes. But if, when you start reaching tens of thousands of rows, you're probably better off with another piece of storage technology. What might be helpful here? Any guesses? Pardon? A database. A database, exactly. So uh, Beth knows SQL, so she picks Cloud SQL and puts it there. That's part of the Google Cloud Platform. You, there are a few different options for using SQL mm -hmm. databases. 
or uses NoSQL databases, whichever you prefer. How would you build this in the system, though? Ah, so now we're hitting the database instead. And this actually takes a little less code than we saw before. So uh, we get joke would be a function as before. Here is some SQL code. This is a very smart piece of SQL code. Did you have a question? Yeah. yeah? That also can be slow. Like the, the application is still coupled. So if, if something goes slow, the Twilio uh, function is still, <coughs> still waiting for response. Yeah. So uh, yep, it's still coupled, that's true. But uh, a cloud SQL or SQL database is much faster than a spreadsheet. Okay. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, in a minute we'll talk about, uh, yeah. I think, what, what you're shooting for. Yeah, excellent, thank you. This is a part, a smart piece of SQL that returns a random row. So order by rand, limit one, <coughs> basically returns a random row from a database. And it's super fast. And I did not come up with it. I copied this from Stack Overflow like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then we just run, I mean, this is asynchronous code, we have to do a promise and things like that, but we run this SQL, we resolve it, return, and, uh, and there we are, that's the code. And we have everything running. And now we have a microservice that is fast because it gets its data quickly. We still have an admin interface that the content creator can use, and we'd write a piece of code here to export. Uh, code to uh, the, from sheets to the database as well. Will we perhaps need someone to analyze the system though? Yes, exactly. There is, this is a glaring uh, hole here. We have no business intelligence whatsoever. So we can't really tune the service because we don't know what's going on in the system. So Beth hires a business analyst whose name is Daphne. And uh, she has all these questions, but when are, most, when are users most active? Which, after which jokes do users request more jokes, etc.? All these an analytical questions that you need answers for if you're going to tune any production service that you've got. So none of that in the system. Daphne goes and asks Charles. And uh, Charles said, well, I, I have no answers to these questions. I have a spreadsheet of jokes here. I don't know. So, uh, uh, so we kind of have an impasse here. So to give Charles some relief, perhaps, how would we code this and make sure that he doesn't have to answer any questions? Right. Charles doesn't have the data, so we can't give it to Daphne. So uh, Daphne goes to Beth and asks, Beth, whenever this microservice runs up here, can't you just add a little piece of code that just writes to an analytics database, like BigQuery, for example? Now you know, and I know, and all developers know, that you start out with a nice, tight piece of code, and we saw it just up here. And then some business owner comes and says, oh, just add this little thing here, and it becomes a little longer. And then somebody else says, oh, just add this other little thing, it becomes a little longer. And so on and so on, and eventually you have this like 200 line monster that nobody dares touch, because it touches everything else in the system. So if if Beth were to add stuff to this microservice to write in an analytics database, what happens if the analytics database is down? Or if Daphne has changed the name of a column or a table, will that screw up the microservice so it doesn't send a joke to the user? That would be terrible. So here uh, Beth thinks of a pattern that she's heard of for insulating various group team, various teams and <coughs> departments within the company and their systems from each other so that they can continue working independently and even systems can go down without affecting the whole service. And that is asynchronous message passing. So if you put in an asynchronous message bus up here, Beth can add just a little snippet of code here that just publishes a message to the bus. It will always work. And then Daphne can write a piece of code up here that listens for that message and takes the data from that message and inserts into BigQuery or whatever database Daphne wants to use. Daphne can even change what database she's using and without uh, this microservice needing to know what's going on. Another um, 
Another cool thing about this is that as more teams are hired, PR, marketing, legal, they might need copies of this data as well or know the traffic numbers. They can just listen to this bus as well. And nothing needs to change in the microservice uh, down here. So the code for this, we'll just uh, skim through it uh, quickly. The code for publishing to, uh, to PubSub. PubSub is, a, is part of the Google Cloud platform. Uh, the code for publishing would be, here's uh, reply, get joke, then, so we call get joke from the main service. Um, here's a new call, publish PubSub message. That is a function that Beth has written. And the rest of, get, of, uh, of this is the same as you've seen before. So let's uh, dig into publish PubSub message and see what that one does. It takes uh, a joke, the joke that is being sent, and the phone number is being sent to. Um, the, um, Beth would just uh, create a data a record object here called data here with all the data that is to be packaged up. And then create a PubSub instance, create a buffer and sort of package that data up and then call publisher.publish. And it's out there on the bus for anybody to listen. Or if nobody listens, that's fine too. The message goes out and doesn't end up anywhere. Um, here, uh, Daphne would write code to trigger her code for on, on whenever a message goes out on the bus. So uh, the way that would look is she calls it post to BigQuery. She can call it whatever she wants. This will take a message and a context and uh, first, she would need to unwrap the payload, <coughs> create her own row that she is to insert into her analytics database. And this depends on what columns she has in her database. And then create a BigQuery object and do an insert on that. And we're done. Uh, and here we are. We have a fairly advanced and sophisticated system here where we have a highly optimized microservice that's highly available, highly performant. It runs on a fast data source. There's an admin interface that the content team can use to add content. There is an analytics piece that is hanging off of, uh, uh, off of the bus. So if, uh, if the analytics database goes down, the main service still keeps running. And we have sort of expansion slots here for other teams to come in if they want to listen to this data as well. And all of this, Beth wrote in less than 100 lines of code. This seems like a very lovely system, but how expensive would it be? Is it affordable enough? Yeah, let's talk about pricing. You might have heard uh, serverless is expensive. This is serverless computing, by the way. She did not um, configure any servers or set up any servers, anything like that. She did not rent virtual machines or do anything with containers here. Serverless, um, some people say, is a little expensive. So let's look at what this system would cost to run. First off, uh, there is, and it's a little cut off here, I apologize. Um, I make some assumptions here about how long the code, how, how, uh, how quick the code would be to run and what memory it would need. If you run it on Cloud SQL, you would pay between $8 and $55 per month for a small Cloud SQL instance, depending on what SLA you want, how big the how CPU you want, uh, what region you want to run it in, where your most users are. So between $8 and $55 for the database. If you're fine with running a NoSQL database, that is far cheaper. That's between 0 and $6 instead. There it is. Zero and six dollars because that's far easier. It's far easier for Google to scale a NoSQL database than a SQL database. So typically, you would probably run this as a in NoSQL environment. Uh, there is, of course, the SMS cost from Twilio. I don't work for Twilio. If you build a service, you need to go and negotiate SMS cost with them. Um, so. Those of you who use Twilio, does anybody know kind of what they charge for the SMS? Between one cent and two cents. Between one and two cents. OK, cool. Oh, you got a much better deal than I think, I, thought, I guess. But I send like 10 of these a month. So maybe you, you're using more <coughs> of the bulk rate. Usually one, one cent to send text, two cents to send an image. Oh, two cents to send an image. Oh, that's more expensive. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. 
Okay, negotiate with Twilio, all of you. Talk to the man in the front row, he'll get you a good price. He clearly got one, yep, better than I did. Okay, let's say we have a million requests per month for jokes. How, uh, so she would of course pay these things, the database and Twilio, right? How much would she pay for BigQuery and the microservice running on cloud functions and all the data on the bus going back and forth for a million hits per month? Any guesses? Any guesses? A hundred dollars? We have a hundred? Hundred? <laughs> we have a hundred. Hundred? Fifty. Fifty. We have fifty. Okay. Fifty? Fifty dollars? Fifty dollars? Anybody? Anybody? Yep. Somebody up there? Gentleman in the back? No? Okay. Well, I'm going to make you guess. Fifty dollars is uh, the latest. What do you say, sir? Forty-nine. Forty-nine. Okay. <laughs> forty-nine. Yeah, forty-nine. And the answer is zero. Uh, because she would actually come in here under the free uh, quota. And then if she gets two million, then she would pay something like two dollars and thirty cents. If she gets ten million, she would pay something like what is that? Twenty two twenty three dollars. So serverless can be very cost effective because uh, you're not paying for a machine to be up and running all the time. I mean, if you pay for a machine, a virtual machine or a container to be there sitting there waiting for user traffic all the time, you most of the time it'll sit idle because you have to get enough capacity so it can handle the peaks. So most of the time you're not at a peak, right? You're in traffic in your system. So most of the time it's not, <coughs> you're not running at 100% and you would pay more than this. Plus, you would pay some IT person to, to configure and maintain the system. Well, although this system seems very lovely and also affordable, does anyone actually use cloud functions? Yes. There are companies that use Cloud Functions, and not only for sending jokes. <laughs> Although there's at least one customer who uses it for sending jokes. That's me. <laughs> uh, so we have a few companies, uh, quite a few companies actually. Uh, I see the use cases, there's sort of three kinds of use cases I see out there. Uh, we have companies like Smart, Smart Parking, and, and others who use it for IoT, Internet of Things. So this is when you have uh, devices out there in the field that send a status or temperature, or in the case of smart parking, they send the status of the parking uh, lot, um, space it's at, uh, like every 15 minutes, every five minutes, something like that. Um, and it's quite hard to set up a backend that will accept these incoming requests 24 seven, all the time, all the time, and never go down. But Cloud Functions is good at that. You have other companies that use it for real-time data processing. So you have a bunch of data sitting over here, you send it over the bus one record at a time, you have a cloud function here in the middle that massages the data a little bit and then puts it in another database. So it becomes very simple to uh, write that piece of code in the middle because you just need to write a piece of code that transforms one record and you don't have to deal with retries or partial failures or anything like that. The system does that. CNN.com, they, they belong to Turner. CNN.com uses that a lot to consolidate logs from all their web servers. You also have uh, these, these conversational applications this is great for request, response, request, response. And that's exactly what happens when you talk to one of these devices, right? A Google Home or talk to Assistant on your phone. So Cloud Functions is a great match for that. So with that, I'm now going to ask all you lovely people to do three things at the same time. They're all optional and none of them are hard. First, I would love to get your input and feedback on this presentation. Also, if you, if you choose to enter in, your, in the survey, if you choose to enter your email address, I will also email you the slides later today. You will also be entered in the drawing for... The mini Google Home. The uh, Google Home that we will, in, uh, in about five, ten minutes, we will raffle this Google Home off, so don't go anywhere. And that's the link, bit.ly slash cloudfunk. Please start filling that out. That was one of the things, remember, three things. Another thing is, if you have questions, I'd love to hear them now. And what do we have so for the people ask questions? The first four people get one of these Google pens that doubles as a stylus and a pen. Also, if you can get this off, then when you click this, the light lights up on the Google logo. 
Yeah, excellent. Who doesn't want a pen like that? <laughs> also, I know that you're dying to hear more dad jokes. Mm. Aren't Zoe, we all? <laughs> Zoe won't let me tell more dad jokes. Oh no. But you can do the next best thing. You can send a text message to the service and you will get a dad joke back within a few seconds. So while you're filling out the survey, um, anybody, does anybody have questions? Does anybody want a pen? Oh, first pen right there. Um, I actually had a question on how does this compare to like Firebase in terms of like speed and functionality? Firebase, uh, Firebase cloud functions? Thank you. Uh, or like Firebase. cloud functions and like as a database in general, like how's the process and time and all that stuff. Nice question. Yeah. So with Firebase, uh, first off, the first thing I should mention is there's something called, this is called cloud functions. Mm -hmm. There's something called Firebase cloud functions as well. If you're using the Firebase SDK, Firebase tools, you would probably use Firebase yeah. cloud functions. It's the same under the hood, just two different tools to deploy them. Then how does this apply, if, like compared to the real-time database, for example? Yes, yeah, so like um, in terms of like, I know the data structures are obviously different with this relating to like Google Sheets and SQL, whereas Firebase is through JSON. But how does it compare on um, like speed wise, uh, which one's like generally faster and which one's like generally better. Yeah, uh, with this one or also with Firebase, you can use with this one you can use any any of Google <coughs> six different database products. So whichever you feel most comfortable with or and there are those that are super fast. There are those that are very fast at uh, that are uh, sort of, um, you write only once, and there are those that are globally scalable and SQL compliant, and you basically have to check. It depends on which of the six databases you choose. Um, so uh, I think you should, yeah, it depends on which of the six databases you use, basically. You can use them. Yeah, question in front row. Um, for, the, for Firebase, I know you can do trigger off of like real-time DB. Yeah. Um, would you suggest doing that or using something like PubSub for different triggers like that for the data? Yeah, you can, in Firebase there's uh, something called the real-time database, uh, JSON, JSON database, basically a JSON tree, and you can set triggers on that. Like whenever this node changes, then run this, this cloud function. I think that's a great match if you're using Firebase database. Um, if you want to get into the larger cloud ecosystem of, of other products, uh, that Google has. You may want to hook it up to BigQuery, or you may, it's things like we saw here. Mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, at that point, uh, you probably want to go with PubSub, okay. this asynchronous processing. Yeah. Because it's a little more extendable. Right. Yeah. yeah. So at one point you uh, mentioned that, uh, uh, something about this, like your function failing, Are you, you said that that was taken care of by the system. Are you basing that on the fact that the rate of the errors are really low? Was that the fact that the system kind of re-automates those calls? Yeah, so this was in the context of PubSub, and if, so you basically you tell PubSub that here's a message of this type, and PubSub sends it out to everybody who has said, I'm a subscriber, messages of that type. If a subscriber picks up the message, and then errors out for whatever reason, PubSub will try to uh, re, um, not deploy, so uh, transmit it. Republish, thank you, that's the word, yes. English second language. <laughs> so it, Pub, uh, uh, PubSub will try to re-transmit re it. So actually you can build some really cool data uh, pipelines on that. Right, if, if, uh, if you write like, um, here's a million rows, I want to transform them in some way, maybe do an API lookup for each of the million rows and add that. In a traditional computing environment, you would start like, okay, look up record number one, make the API call, write to it. Record number two, make the API call. And you would have like a big program that takes a few hours to run. The problem is if, you, if it breaks in the middle, you will have to write retry logic. You would have to have a logic that goes back and identifies which records have I done. You would, there's a lot of stuff you would need to write. If you do it the simple way, like this way, you say, here's a million rows. Just publish one PubSub message for each of the million rows. Now publish one million messages. Now over here, you just write a cloud function that deals with one message only. No retry logic, no smarts at all. Just, I get one record, I do whatever, I do my API lookup, 
translate API lookup or whatever and write that. And, and everything becomes much simpler with this way of computing. Yeah. I was kind of going to tail out of that and then ask something else, basically. So like in that case, is there a way to um, to control or cap the throttle of a cloud function? Or will they basically all trigger as fast as they can? Um, is there any risk of like runaway cost or something on it? Or are there ways you can admin control them? Yeah, is there a way? That's a good question. So now PubSub is fast. So you can have functions can be triggered by HTTP calls, or they can be trigger, triggered by PubSub messages. And we saw both in the example here. PubSub is super fast. PubSub can, <coughs> if, if PubSub gets a million messages, it will just throw them at your code many, many, many per second. Uh, and, but, but Google can handle that because Google builds highly scalable systems. There may be other systems that you interface with that aren't as scalable. So if you hit some API out there or hit like an old school database that can't handle the cost, uh, the, 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 number, the traffic, you could get into trouble. Uh, so you, uh, there's no good way of rate limiting here. You should look into something called the Cloud uh, Tasks API that helps you do like rate limiting and have multiple queues. You can even go in and click and pause the queue and restart a queue or purge empty a queue, that sort of thing. Did, did you said something about cost? Did I answer your question, or uh, yeah, did I answer a different question? Cloud tasks would probably be the place that we go look. Yeah, the Cloud tasks API gives you more control. Yeah. I had a second one, which was more like yeah. uh, architecturally. So this this seems like awesome, starting up like a SaaS from scratch. Um, if you're heavily involved in containers or already running hardware that you're already basically paying for, do you have any advice for like uh, selecting which types of features to attempt this on, or uh, because you're already paying the cost up front yeah. for the other servers you have. Yeah. So you're even though this is very cheap, you're kind of like still appending the cost. Yep. Is there um, a general strategy or anything you've seen so far for how yeah. people choose to do that? Uh, yes. Uh, there is a secret product. Um, if you fill out in the survey, if you enter your email address there, you will get an invite to this product. And that's <laughs> it. You haven't launched yet. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> but that, that, I think that addresses uh, what you said. You already have hardware. You want to be nice to your developers. They should not care about hardware. So, so abstract things of, of the hardware away from your developers, but still run on existing clusters. Yeah. So in going back to the to the joke server. So you, you have so, so, uh, server somebody the end. It sends the HTTP request, gets a JSON with the joke. Uh, I don't, I don't want anybody else stealing my jokes. No. So, uh, so I wonder what, what, what that's, uh, can API to be private? Is there a way mm -hmm. to Yeah, yeah, it? right. So this API we saw here is, was public. Anybody who happened to know or guess the, HTTP, the URL could hit this. So you could do things like, um, you can say, my jokes uh, function can only be hit by this group of users that you define in the Cloud Console. Um, if uh, if you have a um, the client's app out there, you would have to do something a little more smart with keys or something. Um, that would require some more digging into. Okay. Yeah. But, but if you run it internally, like CNN.com does, you don't want anybody from the outside to, be able to hit it. So then you can really lock it down and say only this one user uh, can hit it internally. And I think I have one more. Oh, yeah, I have. This for you. That's a good question. question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going with filling out the survey? Still working on it? We have one. At least one person filled it out. Okay, good. You stand an excellent chance of winning the Google Home. It's only you. Yeah. Did somebody else fill it out as well? Oh, we have. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, should we do the drawing? Or any more questions before we do the drawing? We're doing pretty well on time. One more question, yes. How many dad jokes did you actually write for this? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't write and or. Yeah. He didn't even write one single one, did you? Yes. <laughs> no, he just copied them all. You know that one about plagiarism? <laughs> <laughs> it is also surprisingly hard to find good jokes on the internet that are not offensive. That's almost impossible. Almost Congratulations. Impossible. And that can fit on one line of code in a code example. <laughs> it was a lot of hard work to plagiarize these jokes, okay? 
<laughs> so what, it wasn't just simple plagiarism. You, right. you had to go through steps. Yes. Okay, that's a comfort. <laughs> Uh, so, by the way, uh, Kyle. Well, I was going to add really quick for the Firebase Cloud Function questions that you guys had. Firebase Cloud Functions is uh, written in a node environment. So it's either JavaScript or TypeScript. That's the big difference between what Martin was talking about with uh, Google Cloud Functions. You can do those other languages, but Firebase Cloud Functions are in node. So it, it runs in a node environment. So that's the big difference between the two. So yes, Kyle answered the question, but my dad, who was giving the talk. <laughs> Firebase Cloud Functions are built on top of, and so he was correct. It was just, that's the limitation with Firebase Cloud Functions, is that you're stuck with jobs here in a node environment only. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you, Kyle. You do the drum roll, I'll do this. OK, very good. So um, uh, if you have more questions, I'll be around all day. Plane doesn't leave until late tonight. Look for the pink shirt. I'm happy to answer geek out, talk more about code or anything else. Uh, please uh, come on and look me up. Um, do you see yourself on here? Yeah, yeah, OK. I see a few nods, a few nods. OK, very good. So the way this will work. By the way, I wrote this myself because I wanted to use it at events and such. And then word got out, and it's at wheelofnames.com. Word got out, and uh, now I have like five to 6,000 users per day. So now I need to really fix the bugs that are in there. <laughs> <laughs> you are all free to use it for your own purposes. Uh, we are going to do a spin here, but the way this wheel works is that it's powered by drum rolls. So, can I, can I have a drum roll, please? Yes. Thank you for filling out the survey. I'm looking forward to catching up later.